This is Tell Me What to Read, the podcast from booktopia.com.au. We are back in the studio today talking about the books that we're reading and enjoying at the moment. Today I am joined by Stefania, Nick, and Lara. Hi guys, welcome to the show. Hi. Hello. Hello. Nice to be back. Um, let's get right into it. I'm going to start with you, Lara. Um, what have you been reading and what have you been liking about it? I have uh, just been deep diving into Will by Will Smith. Um, his new autobiography, which has been very long awaited. Um, <laughs> it's been really, really good. He's super engaging. He's, it's uh, chronological um, and he starts from being a kid with um, a turbulent home life. Um, then he goes up into his pursuit of, I suppose, fame. He really was out to, to make it on the rap scene and then that turned into TV and then that turned into movies and it's it's really really engaging he's a really passionate um, person he's got a lot of life lessons that he shares with his readers um, he gets in with the rap he does um, he talks all about fresh prints which everyone knows and loves him for um, he talks about some of the struggles between um, I suppose he covers cultural struggles and family struggles and he leaves sort of no holds barred. He's very, very honest about um, how life can be hard sometimes, but it's definitely, it's super engaging. It's really nice. And he Um, starts, he he goes back to his childhood at the beginning. And if I understand correctly, it was West Philadelphia, born and raised. Born and raised. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) He spent a lot of his days on the playground. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So born and raised in West Philly, he actually um, has, Grew up with three siblings. Um, Both his parents were, they were together, but they had quite a tumultuous um, domestic violence sort of background. Um, And there was some substance abuse and things like that. So he covers all of that, um, which I suppose took me by surprise. It was different to what I had assumed his journey would have been. Um, But he talks about... He's really big on the life lesson, so he ties it into how that shaped the person that he is. Yeah, um, as I understand it, the book was written with Mark Manson, who wrote The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Blank. Blank. Um, (laughs) uh, um, And yeah, it's it's been described as memoir and self-help, like kind of combined. Yes, that is very apt. That is a spot on description. So that's been really good. So definitely enjoying Will, I recommend. Um, And then I have been living the ultimate auntie life at the moment. (laughs) And I have just bought all my nieces and nephews um, different versions of Little People Big Ideas, which are these fantastic kids' books that are illustrated mini biographies of some of the really big notable identities in the last, I suppose, in modern history. So um, we've got Marie Curie and Bob Dylan and all these sorts of different ones. So I've mixed it up and I've gotten different versions you know I've got a few scientists for them I've got some musicians and artists and um, Frida Kahlo and I've been absolutely loving them I cannot recommend them enough for people who want to introduce the little people in their life to (laughs) big ideas I've got got a couple of those um, at home as well for for my daughters and they're so inspiring Um, and the way that they're written they're so accessible and it's just lovely to see like my my eldest is really into art and she really loves the Frida Kahlo one Mm -hmm. I got my niece the Frida Kahlo one and it's beautifully done and it's you're right it's a really accessible way to break down their their lives and as well as their contribution to their particular field so yeah it's really good it's funny we we i was given a whole selection of them to take photographs of for our for our social media earlier this year and we and the best part was there's like different age groups as well so there's we got i got to take one of one and read about david attenborough and all the stuff that he did and then of course then there's ones with michelle obama and all the achievements that she has it's uh it's it's such a fun such a fun like little series and like it makes you wonder god oh, it, how good that so many kids will be growing up with you yes. know books like this in their yeah, lives yeah absolutely and it covers all sorts of diversity um so it you know it covers women in science and it covers racial issues and gender roles and all sorts of things which is so important for little kids to grow up 
knowing as the norm. Really. Yeah, and I don't remember having an equivalent when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely not. They all have different illustrators too, which is really fun. So mm. they're all in a similar theme, but have their own little spin. So awesome. I've been really into those. Oh, jealous. It's, it's <laughs> my reading for my nieces and nephew have is is perk to me. But um, <laughs> so I recommend those. All right, thanks so much, Lara. Um, we'll move on now to Nick. What have you been reading, and what are you enjoying? Hello, yeah. It's it's weird for me to have uh, three books, uh, bring three books to uh, to one of these podcasts because I am a notoriously an incredibly slow reader and and incredibly picky. Um, but yeah, I have been I've been lucky enough to kind of uh, stumble across a couple of classics uh, in the last few months. So we ha I've brought two classics and one kind of new book recently. And the first one, um, which will be one that everybody is extremely familiar with. Have you ever heard of this Harry Potter series? This certain... <laughs> vaguely. Vaguely, yeah. yeah. So I recently, for my partner, we she was uh, we kind of saw a couple of photographs of these really beautiful illustrated editions there's been a lot of illustrated editions that have been kind of coming out as the books approach you know 15 20 years old um and uh there's been uh, a particular edition of both the chamber of secrets and uh, philosopher's stone that were pub uh, put together by the designer mina lima and I decided, well, hey, let's give these a ch uh, let's check these out and see what they look like. And they arrived uh, a few days ago at our house. And oh my goodness, um, if you think that you are, you know, familiar with, of course, you uh, any a whole generation grew up reading Harry Potter. Like we we are familiar with the story, we are familiar with the beats, we know what happens. But um, I mean, of course, you can go f go back to those and read those books with incredible nostalgia. But the this particular these particular editions are not just about the book they are about as well the incredible designs that Mina Lima has provided and it, they are honestly incredible lots of pop-up stuff lots of stuff you can That's interact fun. with um, the drawings are absolutely beautiful um, even down to but not just that just the really creative ways that she uh, that the, that they put the, that the all the artwork is actually put together, um, particularly when even the one that that stood out as I was as we were rereading it last night uh, in bed was just opening up the scene where Harry receives his letter for the first time, and there's literally a letter in the book That's so written cool. with everything that was actually said. And That's amazing. behind the letter is a picture of the of the of the house on the rock. And it's incredibly well designed and extremely beautiful. So to anyone who, you know, is looking to kind of experience the Harry Potter books in a new way, or, you know, maybe looking to introduce their children to it um, and and get give them a sense of what it looks like. And that it's also very different from the films. You know, I think a lot of a lot of those illustrated artworks, you know, are based heavily on what uh, what the films will look like, what the films look like, and what they were designed like, and everything in between. But the uh, but the the artists here really make the story their own. And it's yes, you've got the, the this, this classic story, but also these books are front, uh, these are designs are front and center, and they are extremely beautiful. Highly recommended. My kids totally missed the Harry Potter books because they got into the films. Um, mm. And then they went through a stage where they were really into them. And my eldest watched Harry Potter and Deathly Hallows Part 2 on repeat, like over and over again through one summer holidays. And then one day woke up and was like, I hate Harry Potter now. It's for little kids. I don't want to watch it anymore. And I'm like, oh, okay, what are we going to get into now? Lord of the Rings? And then she's like, no, I love Twilight. And I was like, God oh, damn it. No. <laughs> Oh no, that, that dreaded conversation. <laughs> my um, my brother-in-law has been listening to the audiobooks of Harry Potter while he travels um, and he keeps messaging me being like, this wasn't in the movie. This wasn't in the movie. Why didn't they explain this in the movie? And I'm like, you've got to do them both. They're very different. But yes, that sounds like a third it's amazing. which sounds amazing. They're incredibly beautiful. I think if you, if you do jump onto our social media, there are some photographs. I'll link them in the description um, of the Chamber of Secrets edition um, to give you a sense of how beautiful these, these images and stuff are. We, put them, we shared them on our Instagram so you can take a look at them, check them out for yourself, um, and then go and get uh, copies of both of these books because they are really, really beautiful. Sounds like it would be a great Christmas present for oh. the Harry Potter fan in your life. <laughs> and, and Mark, where can we get, uh, where can you pick them up from? Um, I think it's booktorpia <laughs> dot, dot, <laughs> dot net dot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sounds right. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, the second book that I've brought along is, it's kind of a different one. It's a different sort of classic. Um, this book got dumped on my desk. So for context for all of our listeners, we've kind of been slowly making our way back into the office, uh, you know, post lockdown. And a few weeks back, I came in to, you know, work on the studio and do some stuff. And this book was sitting on my desk by Josephine Tay. Um, called The Daughter of Time. And this kind of, this was, looks like it's a new, a new edition provided to me by a publisher. And I've never checked this book out. And, and often you get books dumped on your desk all the time. And I was like, what is this? This is interesting. Um, and it turns out it's a, it's a very old novel. It's a classic. Josephine Tay, uh, obviously, she was, you know, huge in the crime and mystery genres. And this particular book follows the story of a inspector from Scotland Yard, Alan Grant, who's kind of recovering from an injury. And it's the story of how he becomes essentially fascinated or, or kind of obsessed with this portrait of Richard III, um, which is, he's kind of, Richard III is here on the cover that I have up here in front of me. Um, and of course, Richard III, within the context of, of English history, is regarded as a very controversial figure. I mean, you, you, you only need to look at William Shakespeare's plays and how he's, how he's perceived there, kind of viewed as this very disfigured, brutal character. Um, and but when when Alan Grant looks at this particular picture, this it has no resemblance to the actual person who is uh, who is described in all of previous literature. This man, and so he basically becomes, you know, um, he, he starts to kind of examine this history and ask the question: Is is Richard the Third this this ruthless evil hunchback who, you know, uh, killed his brother's children to to look to to keep the crown, or or was he a victim? of you know uh you know turned and kind of affected by 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 circumstances of the time um it's a very interesting book highly recommended and if, and as i dove into it because it i was just enjoying it i've realized that this book like tops a lot of crime and mystery novel lists i had no idea i was like well, i've never discovered this before and i don't usually go towards crime and mystery which is why i'm looking at you with such interest interest in in terms of this mark because it's it's a fantastic book. And even if it is, you know, some of those books from the 1950s and such may age, like they often can seem a little dated. This one surprisingly doesn't. It feels very fresh still. I've, I've never heard of it. Um, so that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, but the only observation I would make is that um, <laughs> where my mind goes is that Alan Grant is the name of the character that Sam Neill plays in Jurassic Park. <laughs> I love the idea that after he got traumatized in Jurassic Park, he becomes a detective. But yeah. Maybe he has a velociraptor sidekick who comes and helps him like solve mysteries. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you're referring to. Yes. Anyway, thank you for that, Nick. <laughs> but yeah, so she has a whole bunch of, uh, of books out and she's kind of very well revered within the crime and mystery genre. And Obviously, we think of like Agatha Christie of that time. Like, like we think of you know a lot of crime people from that time, and Agatha Christie is one of the ones that stand out. But I'm going to probably dive into more of Josephine Tay's work cool. um, in the coming in the coming weeks. Excellent. Um, and my final book uh, is is a more recent book. Uh, so we we have a whole bunch of folks at, at uh, in our office who are part of the wonderful Brio uh, books team um, and they host an event and then I've only literally started this book yesterday by the way so this will be very brief um, but we we our Brio books team they have a novella competition that goes out every single year which is called Viva la novella and it's kind of for you know for writers of of you know looking to kind of it's it's often been a branching off point for many kind of aspirational writers many uh, fantastic writers have have gone on to greater success off the back of of having a novella manuscript pub, uh, selected and published um but uh, i picked up the most recent winner of the viva novella um which is every day is gertie day by helen meany um and i've only literally about five pages in this is what i'm reading right now so i can't actually go into as much detail about it as some of the other books that we've talked about today but it's essentially the story of a nina is of this character nina who is a tour guide who works um in sydney and she's kind of drawn into as the story progresses she kind of is drawn into this kind of cultural brouhaha a whole bunch of stuff back and forth around uh, you know a particular thing which will which i don't want to spoil because also because i haven't got to it yet um but it basically this book seems right now to be kind of an examination of art it's it's kind of described as an examination of art and politics and identity and 
it's uh, I'm really fascinated by it and seeing and I'm really curious to see what all the fuss is about because I do like a good novella I really do because uh, because of how incredibly picky I am with books and how if I don't like a book within 40 pages I will put it down and it's a it's a habit that I'm desperately trying to get rid of uh having a smaller book and something less challenging in terms of actual length uh is something that I always go oh I'm gonna try that so yeah every day is Gertie day currently my current reading tick excellent well you have to let us know next time you're on the podcast uh what you thought when you finished it yeah um cool thanks for that Nick um so dialing in from home today we have Stefania hi Stefania how are you hello I'm okay just okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah I'm feeling a little bit I'm I'm looking at you guys through a screen so it's that's sort of which is interesting because that's the books that I've picked have all are based on isolation. So it's kind of um, setting the tone, really, mm-hmm. for what I'm talking about, which is interesting. Anyway, very um, unconscious, definitely not planned. <laughs> okay, so look, the two books I'm going to talk about today, as I said, they, they both touch on isolation um, around COVID and the first one is the jo- the new Jody Picot book, um, Wish You Were Here. And this is kind of unexpected because the book doesn't really, when you read the blurb, it doesn't mention that it's going to be about COVID. So I was a bit taken aback, but very pleasantly. Um, the book, it starts off um, in New York uh, and it's right at the start of COVID. So there's only been a few cases. People are kind of talking about this um, this disease. They don't know what it is. They don't know what's going on. The protagonist is um, a woman called Diana, and she's an art specialist at Sotheby's. And her boyfriend is a medical intern at a local New York hospital. And they're set to go on this amazing romantic holiday to the Galapagos Islands. So the night before they're meant to go, her boyfriend decides to stay. He says, well, we're not sure what's going on with this disease. I think I should stay. But he convinces her to go. So she leaves and she goes on this holiday on her own. Um, But as she arrives, the world's gone um, into lockdown. She arrives on the island. The, The ferry that she arrives on is the last ferry to leave and there won't be another one coming back. So She's, she's on this island. She's got no way of, she decides to stay. She doesn't um, leave and go back to New York. She decides to stay on this island. She's got no way of leaving. The island is in lockdown. Her hotel is shut. Um, her um, suitcases have gone missing. So she's got, literally got the clothes on her back. She's got nowhere to stay. There's no Wi-Fi. There's um, no uh, phone um, she, she can't reach anybody by, by mobile and there's no way of her getting money from an ATM. So she literally has the clothes on her back and there's this disease. So the Sounds ultimate isolation. Helpful. Yeah, no. <laughs> Mind you, she's in this beautiful, idyllic island where she was supposed to be on this romantic holiday with her boyfriend. So that's the start of the book, right? And then, which sounds... <laughs> Interesting. And then she befriends this local family um, who give her somewhere to stay. So she settles in and she decides to wait out, like everybody else at that time in the world, thought lockdown was going to be two weeks. So she says, I'll stay here with this family for two weeks until the ferry comes back and I can leave. Um, And sporadically she's receiving messages from her boyfriend who's still in New York. He's sending her emails but she can't reply to him because the email, the Wi-Fi is, is so sporadic. So he's sending her these emails about what life is like back in New York and what the hospital situation is like. Um, so there's quite a lot of detail about what that experience was, was in New York at the time. So, yeah, it's the ultimate isolation story, right? Um, and. And then she finally returns to New York and it's a very different world. She's been so separated from it. She's been on this idyllic island 
where she could walk around and swim in the ocean and with all the wildlife. And then she gets back to a city that's completely changed. Oh, I was just going to say, it's, it's really interesting um, that there's a lot of novels that are coming out now that have COVID as a, as a really clear theme. <laughs> yeah. And this one sounds like it's yeah. really leaning into it. Um, and I, I, I was just kind of going to observe that I think in a couple of years time, we'll probably look back on this period as the period of the great COVID novel. <laughs> um, and yeah, we might have to do... First one. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't really read any. And I was like, honestly, I was a bit... Um, apprehensive when I realised what it was going to be and I thought, oh, is it too soon? Like I yeah. don't know whether I was, I think we're all a bit exhausted by it. I don't know whether we really wanted to, I really wanted to read it. And I think that was maybe why the publishers purposely didn't really in the blurb mention it because I think it maybe is a little bit too soon. Um, but ultimately, I really loved the fact that she gave this humanity back to COVID because mm. um, it's now been almost two years. We, the politicians and the media, they talk about numbers, they talk about stats, they talk about um, they've dehumanised it, right? But we have to remember that behind all those numbers and all those stats, there's actually people who have died and people who are sick. So even just yeah. saying that, say I get emotional. Yeah, mm. it's very easy to forget that there are individuals. Mm. It's yeah. yeah. I yeah. think, and that's what I liked about the book. I think Jody does a Jody Picot does a really good thing where she. Um, I don't think her books. She doesn't really tend to take a position. She kind of lays it out for you, and I think that's why she, her books are so good for um, book clubs because they start conversations, there's a theme, and there's no ne there's not necessarily um, a position on them. It's just starting the conversation going. But I think, and the fact that um, she, in her author notes, she talks a lot about her personal experience with COVID and the people that, it was quite lengthy, um, and she talks about the people that she met when she was doing her research, um, so she's obviously done a lot of research in it and it's a really great reminder for me as well of um, the people on the front line and the medical people who, what, how it impacted them through these emails that she's receiving from her boyfriend and his experiences of it. I think we get a, um, it's a really great insight into what that must have been like for people dealing with it in the hospitals. Um, so, yeah, um, there's also the backstory of her career. So she, because she works at Sotheby's and she's into, um, she's an art specialist, um, her mother was a famous art photographer and her father was an art restorer. So there's that element of it as well. And she has this relationship with um, a woman who is selling this famous artwork that belonged to her famous musician husband who was killed in the um, 70s, which I think Jody Picot is kind of um, basing on John Lennon. So that kind of, that part of the story is also really fascinating. Um, and then how she deals with her career when she comes back to New York and how that's impacted the art industry. So there's, there's all of that. But um, Jody in her author notes... As I was saying, she she actually had a brush with COVID. So I don't know if people remember um, one of the biggest hotspots at the, the very start was Aspen. Um, and mm. she was there at the time. She was at a wedding. And she talks about how everybody that was at her table during that wedding got sick. She luckily didn't. Um, but how that affected her and how she was terrified to leave her house um, during lockdown because she's asthmatic and so she was really worried about um, getting sick. So I think that kind of really influenced her writing of the book as well. So look, even though it's, like I said, the, the book, the blurb doesn't seem to be about COVID but it, it is a book about isolation and about um, that time in our lives and I think it all be one for book clubs. 
Um, and then the second book I'm almost finished is Chow Bala, which is the biography of Kate Langbrook. And ironically, that's also about a woman in another country that gets trapped <laughs> there <laughs> during COVID lockdown. Um, I haven't gotten to that part of the book yet. That's towards the end where COVID hits. But the first part of the book is about her um, journey with her family. Um, they decide in 2019 to go and base themselves there and become locals. So they rent out um, an apartment. Um, the kids go to school there. She's got four kids. Um, they're all going to school. They don't. Um, where, where, where do they go? They go to Bologna. So I was ah. really impressed by that. They don't pick somewhere really obviously where people tend to go. It's not Tuscany. It's not Rome. It's not uh, the Amalfi Coast. They go to Bologna, where a lot of people don't actually speak English. So that was um, that was great <laughs> of them to do that. Um, and I really look. I'm really enjoying it. Being an Italian and having spent a lot of time, like like them, I, I based myself in Italy for almost a year and used that as a um, as a like my base to then go and, and do other trips around Europe. So the fact that she's Australian and she's around my age, um, I think compared to a lot of other books about people moving to Italy, it's one that I can really relate to. And the fact that she's Australian, I think our cultural references are very similar and the things that she observes, I observed. So I'm really liking it. And you know what? I'm not even I'm halfway through the book, I'd already teared up and got emotional three times. So I think that's it saying something. <laughs> it sounds like it's almost um, like an antidote to the under the Tuscan sun um style of, of yeah. Italian um travelogue. Yeah, and you know, look, I read after I came back from overseas, I read Eat Pray Love and I hated it. I'm sorry for all those people <laughs> out there who love that book. I hated it. I felt like her experience of Italy was such a stereotype. It almost felt like she hadn't actually been there. She didn't live there. It was almost like she had read all these stereotypes about what Italy was like and then used them to write her book. Now, that was my experience of it. Whereas with Kate, you can really tell that she lived there. The things that she observes about Italians and about the culture are so spot on, right? She, um, I was just going to... Uh, uh, go through one of the little anecdotes that she says quite early in the book, which had me laughing and crying at the same time. Um, because she's obviously a funny woman, um, a lot of the anecdotes are quite poignant, but also hilarious, right? So her family, they're travelling through Milan and they're stuck in this, um, this traffic jam. And they can't work out what it is. So one of the kids gets out and tries to see what's holding up all the traffic. And they realise that this van has just stopped in the middle of the road. The driver's decided to get out. He's gone to the local, the little local bar. So in Italy, a cafe is a bar. So he's standing there at the counter and he's having his espresso. And meanwhile, all the cars behind him have, have backed up. Um, everyone's honking their horns and he's going, yeah, yeah, hold your horses. I'm, I'm just finishing my coffee. I'll get, you know, I'll, I'll leave soon. And then he gets back into his van and he takes off when he's finished his coffee in his own time. And the traffic just picks up again. And I thought it was hilarious because that isn't unusual. I actually experienced that <laughs> a couple of times while I was there. <laughs> so... Um, you don't normally hear that kind of thing in um, these sort of travel journals. They, they, they focus on the food and all of that kind of stuff, whereas I think she picks out all these really idiosyncratic things about what makes Italians Italians, um, and mm -hmm. it's very, yeah, she, she observed it really well. Um, I haven't gotten to the bit yet where she's, um, trapped there. I'm just starting that bit. But basically, after a year, um, they decide to extend their stay. And she resigns from her TV, her radio show with, with um, Dave Hughes. And they're going to see Italy and travel around Europe. But that doesn't happen because 
they get trapped in their apartment. Um, where they're staying, Bologna in northern Italy was one of the hardest hit places mm. very early on. Um, Italy was one of the very first places to go into lockdown, as we mm. know it now. Um, so I think people remember very early last year all those images of Italians singing from their balconies and trying to make the, the best of the situation. Um, so it's going, I think it's going to be an interesting part of the book and I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Well, thank you for that, Stefania. Um, they sound like very interesting and topical reads. Um, and thank you to Lara and Nick and Stefania for joining me today. You can find links to all of the books that we've discussed today in the show notes, um, or you could just head on over to our website, booktopia.com.au, and have a look around and search for books and add them to your wish list and your cart and maybe buy them and keep us all employed. <laughs> would be very nice of you. <laughs> Christmas is coming up, guys. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Um, anyway, thank you so much for listening and as always, never stop reading. <laughs>